foi a primeira vez que houve uma secção de arquitetura da Bienal. A Europa América foi organizado pelo Gregotti, que convidou uma série de, de americanos, arquitetos americanos, e uma série de, de europeus. Os americanos eram bastante fechados, pois houve um, um, um debate muito quente no Lido, onde há um episódio de, de muito, muita agressividade do Aldo Fanaik em relação ao, ao Tafuri. O Aldo Fanaik fez a declaração de que, ele era um, de que ele era um inimigo da arquitetura. Foi mesmo muito violento e tal. E a minha ideia, como é que é tudo falso em Veneza, é uma cidade completamente cenográfica, aventuriana, eu queria abrir um canal, que eu abri um canal em Veneza, é muito mais importante do que fazer um edifício. Aquilo foi inaugurado sem nenhum espelho, lembras-te disso? Tinha um espelho. O Canon 1 para dizer, isto vai ser assim. Tinha um. Foi das obras que mais gostei. E o escultor e o arquiteto entenderam sobre o material, sobre a, a vista falsa que um espelho dá, há uma, há uma, a verdade do espelho. Eu adorei aquilo. Muito boa tarde a todos, sejam muito bem-vindos a esta conferência que é a atividade que encerra é o programa paralelo da exposição Eduardo Souto Moura, projeto de memória de horas. E, antes de mais, em nome da Casa da Arquitetura, no fim de todo este processo, poder agradecer Uh, aos curadores, em primeiro lugar, ao Francesco Dalcó, uh, que estava previsto estar aqui pelo imprevisto de, de viagem, não conseguiu uh, chegar a tempo do sítio onde teria estar para fazer emissão, e que eu agradeço por todo o seu envolvimento, por toda a sua parceria, pela amizade, e também ao Nuno Graça Moura, uh, um grande obrigado, um, um, um forte abraço, Uh, neste momento de encerramento de um trabalho que foi muito longo, que começou bem lá atrás uh, e que sabemos que também neste período, uh, com o seu grande empenho num momento difícil da sua vida, uh, mostrou a amizade que tem inicialmente, naturalmente, ao Eduardo, depois à Casa da Arquitetura, a todo o projeto, uma grande responsabilidade uh, profissional, uh, um grande amor à camisola e uh, que neste processo todo, uh, Francisco Alcô e Nuno Cassamora, que nunca tinham trabalhado juntos, 
foram colocados pela Casa da Arquitetura neste difícil desafio, que é falar sobre Eduardo Sousa e mostrar a sua obra de 40 anos. Naturalmente, uma palavra muito especial ao arquiteto Eduardo Sousa Moura. Primeiro, a confiança que deu à Casa da Arquitetura logo de início com a colocação do seu acervo pessoal aqui na Casa da Arquitetura. O trabalho que fizemos durante este tempo com os curadores, com a equipa da casa, com o 02 que fizeram um magnífico catálogo e com a equipa toda que foi necessária alocar para a montagem desta exposição, que foi uma exposição acho de muito sucesso e que antes de mais eu espero que se tenha divertido, Eduardo, tanto como, como nós na montagem desta exposição. Foi um processo muito prazeroso um, e que nos vai deixar muita, muita saudade. Esta exposição uh, do Eduardo Souto Moura é talvez a uma última uh, de uma geração de, de exposições, tendo em conta que foi a última que nós abrimos antes do Covid. Abrimos esta exposição a 18 de outubro de 2019, Portanto, já, já não foi o ano passado. Uh, tive uma participação bastante grande, tivemos 293 dias abertos ao, abertos ao público, mais de 34 mil uh, visitas, 5 mil participações no programa de atividades uh, da, da exposição, com 19 eventos. E foi uma exposição que uh, fala sobre 40 anos da, da obra Uh, feita por Eduardo Sotomor, da obra e dos projetos, visto que há muitos projetos que não foram construídos e que só assim, através dessas exposições, é que o grande público, para além dos arquitetos, naturalmente, o grande público poderá conhecer o que é essa parte de, da vida, de, do trabalho do, do arquiteto Eduardo Sotomor, uh, porque ele nunca chega a ser construído. Aliás, 70% do trabalho dos arquitetos, muitas vezes, não chega a ser construído e, portanto, é através destas exposições, dos catálogos, dos eventos que se realizam, que conseguimos rentabilizar e dar a conhecer todo esse trabalho. Eu queria uh, agradecer novamente ao arquiteto uh, Eduardo Souto de Moura. Esta exposição foi uma exposição única também na Casa da Arquitetura, que foi feita na nave expositiva e na galeria da casa, na nave expositiva numa grande mesa de 70 metros de comprimento e depois na galeria da casa uma caixa dentro da caixa que eh, mostrou o ambiente de produção de, 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 do ambiente produzido eh, dentro do escritório de arquitetura, neste caso do ambiente do escritório do arquiteto Eduardo do Moura, com projetos que estavam ainda em evolução. E nessa perspectiva a exposição ia mudando porque uh, trazia as exposições uh, maquetes novas, levavam-se maquetes, <risos> portanto ia interagindo com o escritório do uh, arquiteto e Eduardo Souto de Moura. Eu quero uh, hoje, neste momento de encerramento, agradecer naturalmente ao professor Fritz Nemeyer pela, pela conferência que nos vai dar. Professor, I would like to thank Uh, for accepting your, our invitation and say it's an honor uh, for us to able uh, to account on uh, in participation with uh, this lecture to close the program parallel of uh, this exhibition, this important exhibition. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's an honor for us uh, listening to you. Uh, and, in um, fim, perdão, uh, Uh, e antes de passar ao Nuno, que fará a apresentação da, do, do professor, dizer-vos a vocês que para a Casa da Arquitetura foi uma experiência incrível um, todo este tempo, não só de preparação da exposição, como também do tempo em que tivemos a exibi-la e que trouxemos um conjunto de parceiros, de amigos e de arquitetos, de profissionais a virem connosco debater o que é o trabalho um, dos arquitetos, levando a arquitetura com os arquitetos ao, a toda a população, ou seja, ultrapassando o limite, a esfera da própria, da própria arquitetura. Muito obrigado a todos, boa conferência e vemos-nos em breve. Bom, boa tarde. Vou fazer agradecimentos em português.
Primeiro, estou muito reconhecido à Casa da Arquitetura, ao Nuno Sampaio, a toda a equipe que trabalhou com ele, não vou, são muitos e bons, não vou referenciar, o Nuno representa a todos. Queria agradecer aos comissários que foram incansáveis, ao Nuno Graça Moura, ao Dalcó. E agora, para terminar a minha exposição, tenho que confessar que estou triste, gostei de fazer aquilo. Uh, dear Fritz, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this lecture. It is important for me to end with a reference to Miss, and you are a major scholar of him. So, thank you very much. Now, Nuno, introduce you. Okay, I will just say a few words. Uh, first of all, I also would like to thank everyone uh, that was involved in this exhibition, but Let's make it a little bit faster, otherwise we keep the whole afternoon thanking each other, so it's <laughs> a little bit... Um, um, it's a little bit strange to, to make the presentation of Fritz Neumeyer, because uh, you don't need a presentation, it's one of the most uh, 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 known um, architect uh, architecturations of our times. Uh, he was. Uh, he made his PhD in 1978, and since then was uh, a professor in Dortmund, Princeton, Berlin, Santa Monica, and so on. Uh, and visiting also professor in Santa Monica, Harvard, Leuven, uh, Barcelona, and Pamplona. Uh, he has numerous publications on the theory and history of architecture, including. Uh, well, the most known, uh, well-known book is the Kunstlose of Art, uh, the Artless Word, uh, which is since then one of the major references for all museum studies uh, of, of, of all times. But reducing this, reducing Professor uh, uh, Maya to, to, to his museum uh, specialities is a little bit uh, poor because he has made several uh, other um, studies on several people like Fede Chili and Nietzsche's architectures. And, and, uh, he had made some uh, texts about architecture theory. Uh, the facades of uh, the Cose una facciata di uh, Alberti. Um, and recently the, long, the last, last words of Miss van der Rohe, which is a, uh, a great book that I can uh, should he uh, uh, recommend to everyone, and the book that he's going also to present any, uh, today. He has also um, uh, made several scripts um, about Miss and also about arch other architects. I must say, I read a few weeks ago The Secret Life of Columns, and it's one of the best things I've ever read about the Barcelona Pavilion. So, why is uh, Fritz Neumeyer here today? Because uh, no architects nor his creations have a meaning alone, and Mies van der Rohe's works and thoughts are showing among uh, Eduardo's major influences. Uh, Fritz Neumeyer is one of the world's most relevant scholars of Mies of the last decades. Uh, his major work, like I said, uh, Das Kunstlose Wort, is a major reference to all the studies related to Mies. But Neumeyer's writings about Mies continue since then uh, to unveil extraordinary aspects about his major feature, this major figure of the last century. So, herzlich willkommen, Fritz. Um, uh, we are really honored to have you here. Uh, I would also like to, th to thank the, all, the whole audience. I got to know that we are quite a few, so at the end, if there is time, we, have, we will have uh, some uh, uh, questions. Uh, if we don't have time, we won't do that much. <laughs> Let's see. And I kind of ask you now to switch off your um, uh, micros so that we can listen to Professor Fritz Neumeyer in the best conditions. So thank you very much, Fritz, for being here. Thank you for this uh, very kind introduction. Thank you, Eduardo, for uh, inviting me to 
close uh, the show of your work, which I really appreciate a lot. And uh, I'm really uh, sorry that we can't meet in these times, especially as today, which is now another birthday of me, it's March 27. This is the 135th. Uh, I was invited one year ago, uh, also for March 27th, for the birthday to give a lecture on Mies. And it couldn't happen because of the corona condition. So <clears throat> in the meantime, I did some uh, more research on Mies. Um, let me say this uh, before I start. It seems that he doesn't want to let me go. I'm really now occupied with his work for more than 35 years. And from time to time, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to him uh, because uh, I find his work so fascinating. And maybe it is like with all good or let's say excellent art that you can always discover something new in it and that you are never fed up with it by <clears throat> being confronted to it. So today I will speak about the peculiar relation Mies had to the Bauhaus and with the Bauhaus. In, in, in particular now at the ending of the Bauhaus in the year 1933. But I also want to start first with some remarks on Mises' architectural relation to the Bauhaus. <clears throat> Even though it never actually existed per se, Bauhaus architecture has become a myth and a brand, which is today mainly identified with what was canonized in 1932 as the international style white cubed buildings with flat roofs, glass facades and strip windows furnished with tubular steel furniture. The Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich built in 1929 and reconstructed on its original site in 1986 has no connection whatsoever with the Bauhaus and it never fit the paradigm outlined above. And yet the building is often, as you can see here in this image, used metonymically in advertising to stand for Bauhaus architecture. And the same applies to the Tugendhat House, completed in the summer of 1930. Mies did not join the Bauhaus until the winter semester 1930. And until then he had had no direct relationship with that school but <clears throat> such details are, of course, taken to be irrelevant if it comes to image marketing. <clears throat> Next image, please. <clears throat> In 2017, the architects Anna and Eugenie Bach from Barcelona used their incisive and revealing installation, Mies Missing Materiality, to transform the rebuilt Barcelona pavilion into an exhibition that could also have been called Barcelona Goes Bauhaus. Had it been part of the Bauhaus centenary year 2019, this installation perhaps would have been able to show its implicit criticism. Anna and Eugenie Bach <clears throat> did nothing more <clears throat> than cover the surfaces of Mises' pavilion with white foil. Cast in white, Mises' architecture was degraded to a weightless open box in the international Bauhaus style that had lost the structural, tectonic and sculptural expressiveness of its architectural articulation. This installation eliminated the pavilion's material diversity, its opulence and preciousness and transported the building into something neutral and sterile. Gone was the rich sensuality of the surfaces, matte or smooth, transparent or reflective or opaque. Gone was the tension between the surfaces inside the building. Gone was also the impression of mass and weight, as well as any sense for the tactile and physical qualities of the building. Next, please. 
<clears throat> in Barcelona, Mies used a range of opaque, translucent and transparent elements to materialize vertical spatial boundaries. Their materialization spanned a morphological arc from the densest form of matter to its almost immaterial opposite. The honey-colored freestanding wall section of the Onyx Dioré is the building's monumental center of gravity. Its dialectical counterpart is a luminous element enclosed in etched glass into which light falls through a hidden skylight in the ceiling. This magically glowing and floating freestanding wall of light gives the complementary and seemingly immaterial and weightless counterpart to the heavy and impenetrable marble wall section. Within the tension created being between these complementary opposites, classical marble confronted by modern, in modern industrial materials like nickel-plated steel and frosted glass, the floor-to-ceiling walls of transparent glass also take on a special meaning. Next, please. Next image. They are not made of colorless glass that would make them appear without substance, but they are instead tinted slightly gray or green. Thus, they carry minimalist traces of substance within them and can appear to be distant morphological relatives, if I may say so, of those precious wall slabs of concentrated matter. Mises materiality initiates a dialogue of opposites, opposites that complement each other through the process of morphological transformation. This is Mises' artistic strategy in order to combine disparate parts into a larger whole. Next, please. The missing materiality reduced the building's aesthetic to the point of atrophy. The wall sections were downgraded to empty neutral surfaces. The spaces between them survived the architectural sterilization, but they too appear flat, empty, and without any arresting tension. With the missing materiality, Mises' architecture had lost its eminent vitality. However, with this act of de-architecturalization, Anna and Eugenie Bach made unmistakably clear how far removed Mises' architecture around 1930 was from the white wall mainstream modernism that became known as the international style and was so influenced in particular by the Bauhaus Dessauer Meisterhäuser by Walter Gropius. Mies had a, had a critical relationship with the Bauhaus since its founding. This was confirmed by the first Bauhaus exhibition held in 1923 in Weimar from August to 15th of September, which included two models of Mies projects, the famous glass skyscraper and the concrete office building. For Mies, the Bauhaus exhibition was quite obviously a disappointment. In a letter to Theo van Duisburg, dated August 27 of 1923, he spoke out against the formalism prevailing at the Bauhaus. Mies voiced the fear, I quote, that a wave of constructivist fashion will flood Germany emanating from Weimar. I regret this very much because that would make the work of real constructive artists much more difficult. One could sense and see in Weimar how easy it is to juggle with constructivist forms. This is all, all the Mies. If one only aims mere for the formal, there the form is the goal, where in our work it is result. It appears important to me to demonstrate a clear separation between constructivist formalism and actual, actual constructive work. Next, please. This uh, separation or demonstration Mies made clear in the next issue of the, the magazine G, 
in September 1923. He gave an answer to the Weimar disaster with his legendary manifesto Bauen, Mies made clear in which direction the new art of building had to turn, that it should not become the victim of a fixed idea, any style or ideology to determine its forms. Mies proclaimed, I only quote a few uh, sentences, we know no forms, only building problems. Form is not the goal, but the result of our work. It is our specific concern to liberate building activity from aesthetic speculation and to again make building what it alone should be, namely Bauern building. These chiseled words were accompanied by the design for a concrete country house. It served as a demonstration of a modern architecture in which the new aesthetics would be mutually dependent on the technical production of the concrete construction, as well as on a spatial composition in which uh, balanced uh, a symmetrical core with asymmetrical attached wings. Next, please. One year later, <clears throat> with his design for the Brick Country House in 1924, Mies proved where the genuine advantage of modern building to technology could be found in the maximization of the continuity between interior and exterior. In this design, the modern steel or concrete frame construction serves a radical spatial concept that dissolves the floor plan into freestanding wall elements of which never more than three maximum wall elements were attached to another. The discrete living spaces flow into one another and a relaxed composition of interpenetrating cubes determines the building structure. The building structure. Above all, interior and exterior spaces are made to interlock. Much like the Barcelona Pavilion five years later, a continuum of spaces is created that can only be experienced in its entirety by the viewer moving through it or to use the philosopher Edmund Husserl's term by kinesthetics. In this project, the spatial perception of merging interior and exterior is outlined on a new level. And its ground plan suggested that the modern house should no longer be understood as an inflexible concatenation of separate living spaces, but as a continuum of interlocking spaces that prized and fostered active relationships instead of passive demarcation. With those two house projects, Mies made clear how far removed his architectural ideas were from those of the Bauhaus and with what kind of ambition new standards would have to be set. Mises' marvelous sentence I quote, it is meaningless with what kind of ambition the wrong is done, could have been his verdict on the Bauhaus. Next image, please. <coughs> Compared to Mises' house projects, the Weimar Bauhaus model house of 1923, the house am Horn, designed by the painter Mucha and others, with its schematic floor plan, and interior central living room illuminated only by skylights and without any access uh, to the garden seemed to be an amateurish design. In his review in 1923, the Berlin critic Adolf Bene called the floor plan, I quote, a dead scheme of drawing board geometry and cramped rigidity representing a monastic escape from the world and an inanimate division of space instead of an active organization of space. It must be noted that the Bauhaus itself <clears throat> not at all had focused on the field of architecture at that time. There was no architecture class at the school at all uh, until 1927. Until then, the teaching of architecture consisted of students working as assistants in Gropius architecture office 
making themselves useful in the execution of commissions. In 1927, Gropius gave in to pressure from the students and finally founded an architecture class at the Bauhaus, which he appointed a Swiss architect, Hannes Meyer, to head. Meyer, who called himself a scientific Marxist, pursued a functionalist design philosophy that was strictly oriented towards social needs and the influence of economy, science and technology and their developments. Next image, please. Here we have them all three. In 1928, Gropius unexpectedly left the Bauhaus to head his architectural practice in Berlin. He proposed Mies as his successor, but Mies declined the offer, <clears throat> probably having little desire to wear himself out in ideological quarrels with the functionalist Hannes Meyer. As municipal politics in Dessau shifted further to the right, attacks by the local politicians became fiercer <clears throat> and Meyer had uh, contributed to the polarization by opening, uh, acknowledged uh, a left-wing allegiance and a communist party student group had become active at the Bauhaus, the whole situation increased. Also resistance from within, namely from Kandinsky, <clears throat> uh, heightened the tension so much that Fritz Hesse, the mayor of the city of Dessau, called on Hannes Meyer to resign in order to save the school from being closed down. Hesse and Gropius saw Mies as the only person whose organizational strength and by now international reputation would make <clears throat> him assertive enough to secure the Bauhaus a future. This time Mies accepted and was appointed director of and professor at the Bauhaus in the summer 1930. At that time, the opulent Tugendhat house in Brno was about to be completed. Next, please. In this house, <clears throat> for an industrialist, Mies was able to realize his idea of modern living, expressive materiality, meticulous execution, and opulent space to satisfy the highest demands, though they have been reserved only for a wealthy few. After the Tugendhat House, Mies was never ever able to realize his idea of a new architectural ideal for living <clears throat> at the same level uh, a second time. World economy was struck down in 1930, and led to cutbacks in the construction industry. And Mies did not find clients anymore to put on his generous spatial ideas. These ideas remained ahead of their time, but had fallen out of it as the economic crisis hit and then deepened. During his time as director of the Bauhaus in Dessau, Mies's business prospects as architect worsened. Next, please. Next, please, yes. <clears throat> Here we see a design, uh, a project for the Gericke House that had been turned down in 1932. And on the bottom, you see the Trinkhalle, that's where you could get drinks in Dessau. <clears throat> and besides the small kiosk of this Trinkhalle in Dessau, Mies could undertake the construction of only one single residential building until he immigrated, emigrated to the USA in 1938. The last client Mies had before emigrating was a small business owner who was beset by financial constraints, albeit open-minded and a collector of classical artwork and keen to keep the construction costs as low as possible by among other things, haggling over the architect's fee. Next, please. <clears throat> the, the shell of this single-story L-shaped house was completed in September 1932 and in April 1933 Lemke and his wife moved into the modest brick building with its garden sloping gently down to the Obersee Lake. 
The Lemke house is remarkable by any standards. It turned out to be, however unintentionally, a model house, namely Mises' first low budget, low budget construction of a modern residential building. The house refuted the contemporary critics who dismissed Mises' architecture as nothing more than an expensive luxury product. The floor plan, next please, of this solidly built low-rise construction is comparatively modest. It does not follow the grammar of freestanding columns and wall sections used by Mies since the Tugendhat house. Only two large glazed fronts of the living rooms on the inside of the L-shaped structure to the south and the west provide access, next please, to the terrace <clears throat> and views of the gardens and lake. One of the astonishing features of the house is that despite the project's limited means, its rooms have the spaciousness, openness, complexity, and also stateliness so typical of Mises' constructions. The Lemke House demonstrates in an exemplary way the degree to which the mystery of the inner expanse of Mises' rooms depends on their relationship to the outside world. Mies here conjures space in the simplest possible way. He makes the house itself L-shaped, makes it two wings stretch outwards like welcoming arms, embracing an open space into which the living areas extend. Next, please. At the same time, <clears throat> the house wants to indicate a courtyard that is not only bound but on two sides. There is a nascent third wing, if I may say so, only noticeable at the second glass, that in a glass that emerges like the tip of an iceberg, subtly ensuring that the space somehow can be experienced as circumscribed courtyard space. This third, third wing, consists of nothing more than a wall projection of only 78 centimeter. You see it in the back uh, of, uh, of the, this image, which turns the south facing wing into a most minimal L shape itself. By this suggestion of a boundary, the open space directly next to the house is given an edge without actually marking one. The Lemke house is a courtyard house and yet not a courtyard house. In this half atrium house, enclosed and open expanse hold each other at bay, much as they do in those houses with carefully balanced open floor plans. Mises' ability to express element, elementary architectural ideas using the simplest of means is once again startling and evident. It is a house that can also be understood as a didactic demonstration of Mises' Bauhaus teaching in which he sought to show his students that the simple single-family home was nothing less than an architect's essential design challenge. From the summer of 1932 until April 1933, while the Lemke house was being built, the events took a dramatic turn. In August 1932, the National Socialists, who made up the majority in the Dessau Municipal Assembly, decided to close the Bauhaus and to terminate, to terminate all employment contracts with immediate effect. The Social Democrats abstained from the vote. Next, please. Among the design sketches of the floor plan, of the Lemke House, one drawing shows evidence of the torrid debate about the Bauhaus in Dessau that had just taken place. It carries the handwritten words of Mies on the right corner on the top. For those that can read German, perhaps you can decipher it. It says, Lea Vertrag and Lassungsgründe, teaching contract, reasons for dismissal. 
that Mies possibly in the course of the telephone call from Dessau had written near the top of the sheet in pencil when working on the Lemke house. After the closure of the Bauhaus in Dessau, Mies decided to keep the institution going as a private school in Berlin. At his own expense, he signed a three-year lease on an empty two-story brick building which had once housed a telephone factory on Burgbusstraße in the district of Steglitz. Next, please. The students who followed me to Berlin helped to renovate the rooms, painting them white, albeit both with a smaller faculty and student body. The Bauhaus opened its doors in the German capital in October 1932. On January, 19, on January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Reichskanzler, Chancellor of the Reich. As an institution that had been identified with cultural Bolshevism, the days of the Bauhaus were numbered. From April 11, 1933, police and Gestapo surrounded the Bauhaus and searched for and allegedly promptly found illegal communist propaganda material. Next, please. The Bauhaus premises were sealed. No one was allowed to enter them. And here you see the clip of the newspaper of the other day where it reads that Gropius had left for Russia and Mies would have left for Paris, which of course was pure nonsense. Over the summer of 1933, Mies negotiated with the Gestapo and other government agencies for permission to reopen. It became clear that Hilbers, Eimer and Kandinsky would have to be replaced by pedagogues with national socialist leanings, e.g. party members. Furthermore, the curriculum would have been revised to comply with the guidelines of the new government. On top of that, all Bauhaus faculty members would have to provide proof of their Aryan lineage and it was suggested it would prove beneficial if some of the faculty also joined the Nazi party. On July 20th, 1933, Mies and the other teachers decided to close the Bauhaus as Mies wrote in the view of the economic difficulties caused by being closed down. This is the story of the end of the Bauhaus and it has been recounted publicly with great attention. What has hardly been considered in any detail is what Mies got up to as director of the Berlin Bauhaus in the three months between the sealing of the premises by the Nazis on April 11 and the final dissolution of the Bauhaus on July 20th, 1933. To put it another way, what happened in that interim when the hope of the Bauhaus continuing had not been abandoned, but the Bauhaus could only survive outside the Bauhaus? It is likely that students and faculty members continue to meet here. We see at the day of the closing of the Bauhaus to the left is on the top is Hilbersheimer with his cigar and in the middle uh, it's Lili Reich and uh, surrounded by students. It's likely that students and faculty members continue to meet and gather sporadically in front of the sealed Bauhaus. But more importantly, Mies organized several excursions as letters from students indicate, with the intention of keeping the Bauhaus family together and to somehow replace cancelled classes with field trips. Excursion boats seem to serve as an, an essential function while the Bauhaus was in limbo. Next, please. These boats serve as places to meet and to exchange news and probably as something like a floating classroom on architectural field trips. Boat trips were a natural choice as the Bauhaus at Bergbusstraße 49 stood only a few hundred meters from a small port given onto the southern Berlin's mighty Telto Canal, the waterway of Potsdam and the Havel River beyond. In his Bauhaus memoirs, the American student Howard Dierstein reports many boat trips started from here, 
with most of them ending in a lake side garden restaurant next please or cafe here you see me cutting the cake <clears throat> These boat trips made it possible that the Bauhaus could still exist, exist literally only outside the Bauhaus, without a roof in the open air, as Mies aptly put it, when congratulating Walter Gropius on his 50th birthday on May 16, 1933. Ten days after the Nazis sealed the Bauhaus, there was the first excursion to Potsdam, southwest of Berlin. On May 8, there was another Bauhaus excursion by boat. Next, please. And this is a photo taken on May 8th, 1933, <clears throat> showing Mies and Lili Reich on the boat. Together with Reich and Hilbersheimer, Mies took uh, the students to Paretz, a small village with a country palace built by David and Friedrich Gilly in 1789 the summer residence of King Wilhelm III and Queen Louise. This we know from a letter of the Bauhaus student Hans Kessler to his mother of May 12th from 1933, where he writes, Mies van der Rohe chartered a small steamboat last Tuesday. It went to Paretz, visited the country house of Queen Louise, built by Gilly. From the outside, a very attractive building due to its quiet, austere form. Next, please. We don't know what Mies had in mind when choosing Pirates with its neoclassical country palace built by David Gilly and his highly talented son Friedrich as a destination for a field trip. We can only guess about Mises' reasons to bringing Bauhaus students there. But if we take a look at this venue, we certainly can imagine better why. Mies obviously regarded the unusual architectural ascetism of this royal palace to be helpful for a deeper understanding of modern aesthetics. Paretz was built in 1797 till 1999 for Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, born in 1717 and his wife, Louise. And so they were young people, they were 27 when they uh, asked the architects to, to build this house. Both rejected the observance of any kind of traditional formality in their life and had been looking for a retreat from the ceremonial life of the court. They bought a manor house in the village of Paretz, not far, far from the royal seat of Potsdam, southwest of Berlin, and commissioned David Gilly to convert it. <clears throat> David Gilly was no champion of architecture, of splendor, or of one denoting power, nor was his son Friedrich, who at this time already uh, had a tremendous influence on the teenager Karl Friedrich Schinkel. Next, please. In Paretz, the two-story construction extends in a straight line over 60 meters. Its length is divided by avant-corps into classical ABA rhythm. But these structuring element at the corners and in the middle are kept as flat as possible. They physically only protrude half a stone from the facade giving them no real, but only an indication of a spatial effect. Thus, the compositional features so characteristic of royal residences of the late Baroque period only survive on a minimalist and abstract level. Like in Miesen's nest and third wing in the Lemke house, the intended U-shape in the arrangement of the building elements is more suggested than really executed. Also, the palace has no portico adorned with colors, nor ornamented cornices or window, window frames and pediments, not even pilasters grace the facade. Next, please. On the central axis door, <coughs> of, uh, there's an ensemble of doors and windows, which is based on a Palladian model creates a certain grandeur. 
The low arched window cuts into the upper floor. Reminiscence of a Roman bath gives the central avant on an unobtrusively noblesse. Unobtrusive noblesse. The doorway motive <coughs> uh, lends the otherwise conspicuous building its characteristic expression and ensures its striking effect from afar. Pagat shows how a single arched window can in effect lend an entire building a sense of matchlessness and how generous simplicity and formal dignity can be expressed with an economy of means by artistic reduction and abstraction and by morphological transformation. Next, please. In Paretz, replace trees columns. Two slender and columnar poplar, poplar trees frame the doorway and evoke associations with classical architecture. Poplar trees, a kind of northern version of Cypress, also create precisely calculated a green colonnade to mark a semicircular Cour d'honneur in front of the, in front of the palace, quite possibly an allusion to the magnificent semicircular colonnade courtyard and triumphal arch that Frederick the Great had built behind the Saint Ceci Palace in Potsdam. Next, please. This is the real Baroque model. Next, please. Here you have it. It's hard to take a picture of that in, in order to see that this is a rounded uh, space. With this permeable barrier of a colonnade of trees, Gili enabled the country palace to keep the appropriate distance, but at the same time also casually connect the building with the space of the village beyond. In 1925, Mies proceeded in much the same way when building his first and only social housing project, the Siedlung at uh, the Afrikanische Straße or Afrikanische Housing Estate, next please, in Berlin in the district of Wedding. Having given the four main buildings lower and short side wings into the interior of the block to form residential courtyards, he shifted these structures away from the street. Mies used poplar trees to mark the border between the resulting front of gardens and the roadway beyond. These trees form a green colonnade and create a space that both separates and connects. The gaze passes through it, behold the accentuated cubuit spaces, the shapes of the housing blocks their smooth and emphatically simple facades are painted ochre, a favorite color both of Gili and Schinkels. It's tempting to think that Mies may, or may already have used this project to signal his reverence for pirates. Next. In its structural clarity and formal simplicity, the palace could teach an important lesson to Bauhaus students. It showed that only a few artistic and architectural means are needed to make a building look respectable and convincing. In consequence, clear and simple forms should be the starting point for the architect whose task, as me saw it, is to uncover and express something essential rather than to depict something personal. It showed that architectural beauty can spring from the simplicity and clarity of a building and its relationship to space and nature. And parents could show the students that there has been a modernism that existed before that one of the 20th century. And this fact meant that the new was not as new and unique as the modernists of the 20th century wanted everyone to believe. Around 1910, the architecture of 1800 was discovered as a paradigm by architects who were striving for an architecture of their own time after the aberrations of the 19th century. Peter Behrens was one of them, 
as was Bruno Paul and Mies began his architectural career under the tutelage of both of them. Next, please. This is what I want to show you. It's the, the monograph on Peter Behrens, which came out in 1913. And the last page of the book, there is an advertising. And you see the advertising announces a series of books to be published under the title Moderna Architect, Modern Architects. And if you look at the names, there is Gili and Schinkel, as well mentioned next to Otto Wagner, uh, and, and Theodor Fischer and Alfred Messel. So modernity, as it seems, or a modern architect, to be a modern architect is not a question of the century, but it is a question of artistic quality. And one could further guess that there is not something <clears throat> like a modern or an old fashioned architecture. There is only good or bad architecture. Next, please. And if one thinks of Friedrich Gilly's work, I can't show you uh, anything of it here because we don't have the time for that. With these two drawings, I only want to point at uh, his uh, artistic uh, uh, potentials uh, and, and his conceptual uh, bold energy of, of abstracting forms and trying to pull them down on into the essence and these uh, is a kind of a modernity that also could uh, improve in a Miesian sense by using abstraction as a method of intensifying artistic expression not of lowering it intensifying in the sense of uh, that famous phrase uh, less is more and that behind uh, all historic form there might to be found an essentially and genuine architectural one. Next one. Parents, what not only the, the only example of neoclassical building tradition that Mies put on the agenda for both excursions. excursions. In particular, the villas by Karl Friedrich Schinkel, which had been a discovery for Mies himself in his early years, became the destination of further boat trips. According to Howard Deerstein again, Potsdam and the chain of lakes linked by the Hafer River were the, several, were the destination for several boating excursions led by Mies. And Deerstein writes, I quote, One such trip carried us southwest to Potsdam, where in the neighboring Royal Park we saw a number of small, informal, loosely articulated retreat structures built for the German princes by Karl Friedrich Schinkel and then follows one of Mises' heroes. Unfortunately, he gives no other hero of Mies of that time, but he obviously, all the Bauhaus students knew at that time that Schinkel was definitely one of Mises' heroes. The buildings he meant were the famous Charlottenhof, which you see here on top of his Schinkel's etching from uh, 1830s, uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, the photo I took that how it looks today. The Charlottenhof and the neighboring gardener's house, both of which Schinkel built for the Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, starting in 1826. For me, Schinkel became one of his great heroes, at least for two reasons. For his idea, of spatialization, spatialization of architectural space, and for the idea of morphological continuity of architecture and nature. From his early years on, Schinkel shared the belief that architecture must be regarded as the continuation of nature in her constructive activity. This theory is almost didactically depicted in a, a pen and ink drawing of Schinkel from uh, 1810. The next, please. The, the Traunsee by, by Gmünden. This drawing gives much more than just an idyllic scene in the mountain setting. Schinkel portrays the metamorphosis of architecture and nature as if each were holding up a mirror to the other. 
In this picture, a log cabin sits opposite a large tree. The two are connected by a grid of slender wooden poles that form the roof of a pergola. Reading the picture from the right to the left, the viewer sees the gradual architecturalization of the tree, its crown extending into the grid of the pergola and then transforming into the construction of a wooden house. Reading from the left to the right, an analogous reverse transformation becomes apparent, that of the wooden house turned back slowly, gradually into a tree. Architecture and nature are paired opposite for Schinkel that can in their constructive nature become a couple almost by themselves. Schinkel's Potsdam Villas are built celebrations of the same approach and follow this idea of a transformation transformed now in the architectural vocabulary of classical or neoclassical forms. Next, please. This is Glienicke. This was also on the agenda, I suppose. The pavilion building expands with its arms stretched out and pulls nature close to its side. As nature embraces the building with its overgrowing pergolas, it seems that both architecture and nature are strongly desiring each other. Besides this intense merging of opposites, it's the ease with which the Schinkel Villa deals with both closed and open form. Next, please. <clears throat> Here you see the ground plan of the Charlottenhof with this on one side attached pergola. This is the view that Schinkel depicts in, in, in this uh, engraving. <clears throat> The architectural ambivalence between a symmetrical body and uh, an asymmetrically attached element like a pergola, early 20th century architects could render as modern. Peter Behrens was one of the first architects to recognize the creative potential of this ambivalence, even if he saw Schinkel's asymmetrical floor plan of the Charlottenhof more uh, as a way of enhancing a building's monumental effect than of unfolding its spatial freedom. Next, please. This is the, the Behrens House Wiegand, and you see that he adopts the ground plan with a one side attached pergola that also pulls the space with an arm, in, in, like an arm in front of the side. So, in his Wiegand House, of 1911. Next, please. He incorporated the floor plan of Charlottenhof and Mies, as a collaborator of Behrens, followed him using the Charlottenhof seam as well for his house, what you see here, the house Werner, built only one year later than the Wigand house of Behrens in 1912. You see that the ground plan is almost identical with that of Behrens and also takes account of this asymmetrical uh, and combination of a used uh, of, a, of, a, of a closed form and an open one. At this time, that uh, in the early work of Mies, the debate between closed form and open form begins. Next one. In the 1912 design for the opulent Kröller Müller residence in Wassenaar in the uh, Netherlands, clearly gives testimony, testimony to this. Following in the formal strength of Schinkel's neoclassicism, Mies here for the first time develops an asymmetrical, though balanced floor plan with open spatial arrangements. The elements connecting the different cubical flat-roofed buildings show Mies using the entire morphological repertoire contained in the architectural landscapes of the Schinkel Villa. Raised terraces, water basins, sunken gardens, garden courtyards, pergolas, arcades, columns, even caryatids, etc., benches, statues, and so on. This project of 1912 came to occupy 
a prominent place in Mises' imaginative universe. The fact that Mies was able to reconstruct the lost floor plan, which you see here, by sketching it from memory decades later to his Bauhaus students, speaks for itself. According to Dierstein, Mies also talked about this project in very detail. It was also the project that Mies initially wanted to uh, give, uh, to hand in for the Bauhaus uh, exhibition in Weimar 1923, but Gropius turned it, out, uh, turned it down in order not to be modern enough. Taking this into account, visiting Schinke Villas with his Bauhaus students, for me, seemed almost to have been a must. Next, please. When Mies took his, boat, his students on a boat trip to the Charlottenhof in May or June of 1933, he introduced them not only to an architectural paradise of the past, but as well to his own germinating world of architectonic ideas. Next, please. In the Charlottenhof, Schinkel staged a poetic marriage of nature and architecture, drawing an arc that reaches from the monumental Doric Calum Portico in the west, <coughs> in the uh, small palace uh, axis in the west, back to its counterpart in the east in the garden, a rustic hut representing the origin of architecture in its most natural form. Between these poles of the east-west axis in which architecture's historic course unfolds, <coughs> its morphological richness presents uh, itself to the visitor. Next, please. The moment they pass or you pass through a small ensemble of leaf-covered col columns to a flight of steps. It takes the visitors up to a sloping embankment on top of the terrace. Schinkel had banked up in front of the house to provide a green plateau and space for a water basin. Next, please. One shorter side of the terrace <coughs> is bordered by the residence and its garden facing central portico, the other by a semicircular bench that sits on the central axis of the house. This semicircle, covered by a tent roof, hovers above the park like a balcony in the theater. Next. And invites to enjoy oneself in a dialogue with the panorama of the park. Statues were also employed as mediating elements. Next, please. In this case, it's Apollo with his muse Clio. In them, the paired row of pillars of the pergola culminates in an anthropomorphic ending, or is it the beginning, which suggests a con continuation of the movement into the depth of the surrounding space towards the horizon. Next, at the backside of the exedra, pergola garlands of wine vendors climb along the wires into the garden, the whole process of morphological transformation, of gradually turning architecture uh, elements into natural elements or vice versa, finds its clue, as already mentioned, in the primitive hut <coughs> in the middle of the garden, suggesting uh, that nature seemingly on its own and without any aesthetic speculation, we might, as in Mises' words, like in his festo, gives birth to architectural form. Next, when Mies in 1933 took his Bauer students to the Charlottenhof, the source of his enthusiasm for Schinkel was a different one than that of 20 years earlier. After 1919, those architectural elements Schinkel had deemed as indispensable architectural necessities for signifying life like columns and beams, pilaster and cornices or plastic ornament, they were taboo and morally no longer tolerable for the 20th century modern architect. 
From this point of view, the Charlottenhof reminded of an architectural substance and morphological complexity that had been sacrificed by making technological rationalism, functionality and formal extraction the foundation of the discipline. Mies was, as most modern architects, convinced that this cultural loss was the result of an irreversible process of modernization and had to be accepted and worked through. But unlike many of his modern colleagues, Mies understood that this condition was a challenge and obligation for the modern architect to come up with an equivalent artistic answer to and given in uh, contemporary means. The loss of sensation and appreciation that came hand in hand with formal extraction had to be substituted and countered by new aesthetic principles that, that perhaps even could raise the sensual qualities of architecture to a new level. Thus, Mies, Mies felt a necessity to renew the art of building from within, something that also required a spiritual dimension. The goal Mies consequently set for himself, next please, is condensed into one single entry in his notebook dating from 1928. And uh, if you would be able to read German, it would be even difficult to decipher it for you. Uh, so I'll translate it to you, where it reads, who nowadays still feels anything of a wall, an opening? We want to give sense again to things and liberate them from forms without life, from formalism and protect them against one-sidedness. And then on the other side, give meaning back to the words, handling of forms. So give meaning back to the forms is said and uh, to raise uh, the architectural uh, phenomenology uh, onto a level, uh, another level. These few words essentially contain Mises' entire architectural program of the late 20s. It is about experiencing things in a new way, exploring their essence and filling them with new meaning. The construction of meaning of architectural phenomena was necessarily bound to renewing the sensibility for the genuine architectural and its emotional content. Reconstruction would not mean a revival of forms that had become meaningless because they belonged to an extinct society and its time, but the redefinition of meaning of architectonic phenomena on the premises of technical and cultural possibilities of the modern age. And for me, this restitution of architectonic phenomenology meant being unconstrained by past or contemporary dogmas and overcoming one-sidedness in all its ideological approaches, be it futurism or formalism or functionalism or whatsoever. The life signaling necessities in architecture had to be discovered at first hand in matter and space and not in form as such. For the freedom of open room form, the Schinkel Villa with its complementary continuum of interior and exterior and its morphological continuity in the unfolding of built contrasts still remained a model. The method of placing the building on top of a podium and pushing the construction's boundaries beyond itself through extending parts like courtyards, terraces and garden walls for me became the point of departure. With this method, interiors could be created in exterior spaces and vice versa, making the one appear to be the continuation of the other. Next ones. In the Langer and Estes houses in, in 1927, <clears throat> designed in 1927, still built in with brick facades, this intimate dialogue between the architectural object and its environment for the Mies time for the first time could be realized in full scale. Here, abstract means can achieve 
a composition of tremendous special, spatial wealth. Next, please. Mies developed floor plans, as you can see, in which the living eras telescoped themselves on a monumental podium into space in staggered formation. Rooms interlock and overlap in such a way that it is possible to, to look diagonally into one room from the outside, next please, out of it again into the next room and through it back outside. Next, <clears throat> where you see that the podium serves <clears throat> as a stage for openness and, and monumentality, for the staging of opposites as well. Next, please, as the place of the encounter of nature and architecture. The experience of spatial continuity is also supported by challenging aesthetic impulses like the placement of windows. Mies makes use of this architectural element that usually serves the interior next, also in exterior spaces like the outer wall of a lodge. Here you have it. If you look at the right first, you have the situation that in, in the left part, uh, you first think it, it might be an interior space and then you realize it's an open space, but it has a window like in a, being in a living room. And when you leave the living room through this door, you, you see this window outside. So what he wants to say is uh, this idea of a continuation of space is that the exterior space becomes the quality of an interior and the interior space becomes a space quality uh, like an exterior space. At first glance, the viewer perceives exterior and interior effects as having switched positions. Only when taking a closer look and when the viewer is in motion, the building's real spatial identity does reveal itself. Next, please. Windows that look back at, at the viewer are part of a self-reflexive morphological architecture that only comes to life with the movement of the viewer through space. In Barcelona, Mies achieved a similar confusing interlocking effect through reflections on polished stone and glass surfaces. The boundaries of room become blurred and interior and exterior seem to overlap. Again, an effect that dissolves only as the viewer moves through space. Next. Also, viewing axes offset inside the house and room high doorways. Mies here used them for the first time and from this time on ever since. Room high doorways, which of course also should contribute to this uh, impression of an interior uh, as an exterior. To underline the connection of all rooms in, into an interlocking sequence and make the interior appear like the complementary continuum of the exterior. Next, another t uh, telling detail I found in these houses, there are three steps embedded into the green in the garden and this minimum of a stair would certainly not be needed for practical reasons <clears throat> in order to overcome a slight different ground level. But these stairs serve the aesthetical function of making your steps aware that you are passing a boundary in space. Next, please. <clears throat> Again, the Estes house here you see also these uh, on the floor, another open window on the first floor. When Mies, I'm coming to the end. When Mies took his Bauer students in the summer of 1933 to visit Schinkel's Charlottenhof, he certainly not only wanted to convey to them a historical lesson about the specialization of architecture. Charlottenhof was perhaps also meant to convey a better understanding of Mises' own reading of what modern architecture essentially should be about. Next. To his students in Berlin, 
1933, Mies could not give a full demonstration of his redefinition of architecture's phenomenology by a building of his own, simply because he did not get the opportunity to build one. Perhaps Charlottenhof might have been a substitution for the missing Mies. Philip Johnson would have supported this perspective. After 1930, he visited Mies almost every year in Berlin and stayed there for weeks. Through Mies, Johnson had learned as well to admire Schinkel, and he later attributed Mies to be the Schinkel in the 20th century, suggesting Charlottenhof to be the Barcelona pavilion of the 19th century. Next one. In March 1933, only a few weeks before the Nazis searched and sealed the Berlin Bauhaus, Mies wrote about <clears throat> the true architectural benefits of modern steel construction. I quote, they are genuine building elements and means of a new building art. They permit a measure of freedom in spatial composition that we will not relinquish anymore. Only now we articulate space freely, open it up and connect it to the landscape. Now it, began, it becomes clear again what is a wall, what is an opening, what is floor and what ceiling. Simplicity of construction, clarity of tectonic means and purity of material reflect the luminosity of original beauty. Next one. It took Mies another 35 years to give an ultimate build demonstration of this understanding in his very last building, the new gallery, the new National Gallery for Berlin. I thank you for your patience. I hope I'm not cut off. <laughs> <It's just here. laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> Thank you very much. It was marvelous. Great I enjoyed it. I have a doubt, but no one can explain, please. It, we are opening now for the questions. If uh, I don't know how many questions there will be, because there are a lot, uh, some hundreds of people hearing to you, so it might be difficult to um, uh, make a gestion of this, these questions. Eduard was asking here something that he didn't notice. It's just a detail. In the house Lemke, uh, you show a slide where it's op the opening of the of the one Zimmer to to the to the, to the, to the garden and to this beautiful tree and the lake. And it seems that in this there wall, in this concrete wall, in this sort of brick wall. wall, there is a sort of uh, opening. There is a, a window closed. A window closed. He was asking if there was a window or not. It might yes. be some doubt. There was a window because uh, after, <laughs> after, okay. after 1945, this building was used by the Stasi and the police because on the other side of the house, that's where uh, important where important party members uh, stayed, and they had to have uh, their own police guard. And in order to have a good view to the <laughs> other to the house in the other side, they they broke a, a hole into the wall and placed a window there. So this has been taken out, and the wall has been closed. But uh, you can see because you can't get the same stone again. You you see that there is something. Uh, yeah. I thought I thought that it was this. Saying it's too much domestic. I want to, <laughs> to be more abstract. Oh no! It's okay, it's thank you. It's so we are waiting for for questions. I, may I have one? Uh, may I pose one eventually? Um, uh, regarding architecture as a continuous process that Mies always regarded and this lesson is very clear in that aspect. What do you feel is the presence of Mies in today's architecture, which is a bit, a little bit confusing, the presence <laughs> or the absence? 
because uh, this is something very I, uh, I think, enigmatic today. No, no, I think that's an impossible question. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, from our time, uh, Mies is so far away uh, in, in, uh, for most of the architects because uh, today uh, architecture starts with an image. You know, not even with form. It starts with an image, and it's to make make an interesting or impressive or overwhelming image to become built. And then it's not a form that that is developed out of, let's say, construction material or something else. But today it seems to be fashionable to start the process from the other end to start with an image and then make make this image buildable. And this is how the buildings then look like. And after a couple of years, because they, they, they are uh, not really built, uh, well built, uh, they, they look uh, horrible. So I think what, what perhaps remains uh, in the work of architects uh, like, like you, Eduardo, for me, is uh, that, that there is this, this understanding of uh, let's say, uh, an, an architectural, um, um, how to say, um, essence, you know? And, uh, and, and that architecture is something which is put together, it's made, it's built, so I think it, the, the building process is, is also an important part, and that uh, form has something to do, architectural form has something to do with this uh, process of building, with its construction, with its materials. And to make these necessities of architecture become the, the, the source of beauty. I think that, that is, uh, for me, uh, the, the message of Mies that uh, in, in, in some or other architects' work perhaps uh, uh, is uh, is present. So, not all are those uh, that uh, are addicted to to imagery, but it, it's an architectural ending of architecture. I would say this is what what means 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 for me. So you can have a pictorial understanding of architecture. You can have an ideological understanding whatsoever, and. Um, but I don't see, and, and also another point is that we, we, I think I cannot summarize Mises' work into one kind of specific architecture. You know? So the American uh, Mises is a, a rather different one from the one I've showed here, because uh, when Mises comes to Chicago, uh, he's... Uh, uh, introduced to the steel construction for uh, for the first time in in reality or on a completely different level and that is becomes for him uh, the material he, he wants to understand and he wants to build with whereas before that here in Europe uh, steel is just something that helps you you know to uh, uh, get an open ground plan I think that question is really difficult, you know, uh, to answer. Okay. So we are uh, having here some questions. Uh, Daniel Gomes is asking here if you think that the golf project was also in, inspired on Schinkel's pergola. The which project? The, the golf project in, in Krefeld. Krefeld. No, not so much, I would say, no. And another one? So I mean, in an abstract, in an abstract way, it, it is the composition of opening spaces, open views, and open the building to the, to the landscape. I mean, that, uh, I think, uh, Mies has learned from the Schinkel Villa, but it, it's not. And also, Mies is not adopting something that you could, and he never spoke about it uh, as well, so there is no direct taking over, this is what he does in his early years, but then only the ground plan. Uh, the building looks completely different from from, from Schinkel's, for example. And, uh, another question here is 
from Artur Franco is um, how do you relate Nice architectures over and his design over in a formal uh, and philosophical way? Can you, can you repeat the question? How do you relate Mies architecture over and his design over in a formal and, and philosophical way? Well, my answer is go and read my book. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, I, this I have done 35 years uh, ago and uh, there, is no, there is no simple answer to that because uh, that's a very complex thing. I, I could give a, a, com a separate lecture on that one because uh, Mises' connection with philosophy starts with his first patron. He builds the first house uh, for uh, a professor of philosophy at the Berlin University, Alois Riel. And this man becomes uh, a friend, or Mies becomes a friend. He becomes like a son of, uh, of this family. And uh, till 1924, when Alois Riel dies, Mies is uh, visiting the house many times. He shares the, the company of uh, colleagues of, of Riel. And, and Riel is definitely the one, I would say, that brought Mies also in contact with, uh, with philosophy in a, uh, in a more, uh, let's say, explicit way. And he was familiar with philosophers as well in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So he knew, for example, this is what I have pointed out my, in my book, that was a discovery also for me, the, the half Italian-German philosopher Romano Guardini. And uh, his writings became, in the 20s after 27, became uh, highly significant for him. And, uh, and in his notebook, which I showed just one page, the, the, the passage I uh, showed to you was also related to a reading of a text of Guardini, this question, who today feels something of an opening? But it was a translation, you know, Guardini was not speaking about openings and walls and steps and stairs, but about uh, words and, and other cultural phenomena, and Mies translated this approach of the philosopher uh, who felt that in the modern uh, times uh, there is a process of devaluation uh, uh, that, that he could apply this or, uh, to architecture. And should, uh, and for him as an architect, the, the task would be a kind of re-evaluation uh, of architectural phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 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 I will ask you only one more because uh, uh, you, know, you are tired. Eduardo says he has a lot of questions, but it's too much. So, it's on for an hour, I pull up. It's better that we arrange that. We meet sometimes in Berlin. We better know you can in Berlin. Come back to Portugal. Uh, but I will question you on uh, a question that a friend of mine was discussing, uh, also a professor in the Vienna University was discussing with me uh, about the gothical influence influence on uh, Schinkel, yeah. which has in his first period, and how this gothical influence came also to Mies. And, uh, that is to say, how Mies is influenced to the gothical style. Well. He is born in Aachen. Do I have to yes. say any anything else? No. So, you know the famous chapel, the Gothic chapel in Aachen, and and if you ever uh, come to this uh, this place, you have to go there because there is a Roman nest and Roman octagon where mm -hmm. the Emperor Karl was had his throne, and next to it there was 200 years later or 300 years later. A Gothic, and uh, and this combination of a monumental, a very transparent piece of architecture, and this, this meeting of two architectures was certainly has impressed me a lot. He was a friend of of uh, all these large space uh, cathedrals. In this sense, for example, do you consider the the project for the Friedrichstraße a Gothical project? In 
No, no I would say so. No, it has it has it has some formal affinity, you know. If you take the rounded shape of this skyscraper, the glass skyscraper, not the first one with these sharp edges, not the razor blade, but this one with uh, with this curved profile, then it almost looks like if you look at the Gothic pillar in a church, you know, like it would be stones. It has almost the same forms like a pillar, a fluted pillar, uh, translated into glass. Uh, and uh, when Mies speaks of skin and bone architecture, then perhaps I would say there, there is a Gothic uh, connotation in it. Uh, because it's, uh, and if you, if you see that chapel in Aachen, which is really absolutely amazing, uh, you will understand that that is to say that is skin and bone architecture. Uh, but formally not. He was uh, also one of his other heroes next to uh, Schinkel that uh, Dierstein did not mention in his book uh, was Alfred Messel. And he, Alfred Messel came before Schinkel, before Mies discovered Schinkel. And Alfred Messel was one who also was strongly influenced by Schinkel, but also as well influenced by, by Gothic architecture. And if you think of the famous uh, the famous Wertheim department store that had been built, one of the first glass fronts in, uh, in Leipziger Straße, I think 1898 or, or 93, uh, it, it's a complete reducing of, of the facades only through flints with own members. <laughs> now I have some to do that. Okay, uh, I don't know, Fritz, as far as we are concerned. There are lots and lots of other questions. Uh, I think you are also more uh, tired, but... Uh, no, don't let's, uh, let's uh, if you want, we can continue, but... Um, no, you decided. Oh, okay, only one more. There's a here uh, someone asking about your opinion. Why the staircase in the Tugendhat is so big? <laughs> in farms with Swissage, the meaning of or use of the first terrace after the four steps of entrance. That's what you should ask for this. That's better. <laughs> the answer is very simple. You will realize that once you once you are there. And yes. Yes. You know? Okay. So. Also, in, in, and, and it's not just stairs. It's not just a functional element. Take the stairs at the two hundred house. It's the way you go up the stairs that decides, you know, and not getting up from one level to another. And that a, a, a staircase that also exposes you to it's a spatial it's a spatial experience to step up uh, step up uh, to this podium uh, on the Tugend house and it's the same at uh, the Farnsworth house it's even uh, more it's interrupted as a floating floating podium in between it's one stair the stairs and then comes the floating podium and then another one and you have a grand view you know, not on the building, but on nature. It's almost a ceremonial approach, I would say, uh, to, to to this uh, window into nature. I think there was also a picture of Schinkel with a stair that somehow reminded me of the to the Nat house. But, okay, thanks. We are. Uh, I think we could end here. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful lesson. We are really uh, amazed by that and uh, hope to meet in the future in Berlin for further questions. <laughs> More questions. <laughs> and, let's, have uh, drink, let's have a drink on Mies now. <laughs> on Mies, yes. I, I, because uh, I don't know if people have noticed, but uh, as uh, Fritz Neumeyer was saying today, is Mies' birthday. 131st birthday, so it's the ideal um, uh, day for this lecture on, on Mies. So I would now uh, give the word to Nunes to uh, end this uh, 
this conference. Thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, it was really amazing to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fritz. Thank you for your lecture. Eu queria terminar este, este, este momento, esta tarde, agradecendo a todos que eram presentes, agradecendo mais uma vez aos curadores eh, Francisco Alcô e Nuno Graça Moura, aqui o Nuno Graça Moura com a responsabilidade de apresentar o professor eh, Fritz Neumeyer, ao Eduardo Souto Moura, dizer que foi uma, um, mais uma vez uma felicidade, eh, vamos estar envolvidos noutros projetos que brevemente vamos tornar públicos, com o arquiteto Eduardo Souto Moura, eh, também bastante agradáveis e queria eh, convidar-vos a todos eh, para a abertura da próxima exposição da Casa da Arquitetura okay. epigrafias de Guido Guidi e Álvaro Siva o fotógrafo italiano Guido Guidi faz uma visita através das suas lentes às obras de eh, Álvaro Siva e abrirá aqui na casa na galeria da casa dia 17 de abril a exposição na nave expositiva, na maior nave. É uma exposição que abrirá dia 8 de maio, mesmo com estas, com, com estas restrições inerentes ao período de Covid que atravessamos. É para, é para nós, naturalmente, um gosto poder abrir a casa à visita das pessoas. E é convidar-vos convidar para a exposição Radar Veneza, no fundo é uma vista sobre a participação portuguesa na Bienal de Veneza de 1975 a 2021, acaba dia 8 de maio e, portanto, convido todos a estarem presentes nas aberturas destas duas, duas exposições. Mais uma vez, muito obrigado a todos, aos que estiveram presentes. Professor Fritz Neumeyer, thank you uh, one more time. Thank you. Thank bye bye. It's been a pleasure. Tchau, Eduardo. Foi a primeira vez que houve uma secção de arquitetura da Bienal. A Europa América foi organizada pelo Gregotti, convidou uma série de, de americanos, arquitetos americanos, e uma série de, de europeus. Os americanos eram bastante fechados, pois houve um, um, um debate muito quente no Lido, onde há um episódio de de muito, muita agressividade do Aldo Van Eyck em relação ao, ao Tafuri. O Aldo Van Eyck fez a declaração de que, ele era um, de que ele era um inimigo da arquitetura. Foi mesmo muito violento e tal. E a minha ideia, como aqui é tudo falso em Veneza, é uma cidade completamente cenográfica, aventuriana, eu queria abrir um canal, que eu abri um canal em Veneza, é muito mais importante do que fazer o edifício. Aquilo foi inaugurado sem nenhum espelho, lembra-se disso? Tinha um espelho. O canal um para dizer, o rei, isto vai ser assim. Tinha um. Foi das obras que mais gostei. E o escultor e o arquiteto entenderam sobre o material, sobre a, a, a vista falsa que um espelho dá. Mas há uma, há uma, a verdade do espelho. Eu adorei aquilo. Thank you.